beekeepers or Snow King Beekeepers Association, and has her uh, her she's working to get into the master's class, but has currently has her journeyman's beekeeper class and teaches many of the uh, virtual classes that are going on right now for the Wash uh, Bee Association. So. Ellie, I'd like to turn it over to you to um, share with us tonight your uh, interesting research on the history of beekeeping. Okay, thanks. And to share oh. screen, we did this before. I share screen. You're there. Okay. Oh, you hey. left. Oh, you left. Oh, no. How could I leave? Oh, no, there's your PowerPoint. I, I guess slide. that's what you want. I think it you're just doing took it right. a Okay, okay, this technology is wonderful when it works. Um, Snow King Beekeepers, you already explained. Oh, my name is pronounced Eli Oakletree. Seriously, women are never Eli I am. Okay. My bad, sorry. I know, well, you have to be old enough to know a top of the chart song called Eli's a Come and Hide Your Heart's Girl. Anyway, Three Dog Night. It, it, it's old, you have to be old. And I ended up with the nickname Eli. Um, so you already said that, uh, yeah, I'm journeyman. I, Hoping to get into that master's program. I am a Western Washington native. Not that that's important for this. And my background is science research, uh, basic bench research. My talk, I have to admit, is basically cribbed from a wonderful woman named Eva Crane. She is world famous and she wrote an incredibly detailed book called The World History of Beekeeping and Honey Hunting. And she also wrote another one called Honey. And those, I'm really just doing sort of a book report on what she said with my perspective on it. But the book is so fascinating. She traveled the world. She got people to send her pictures. She met everyone between World War II and when she died a few years ago. Everyone who was a big name in, in beekeeping, she knew. Look her up. If you have never heard of Eva Crane, you need to. Um, so she wrote this really big long book it's full of pictures and this is kind of a soft talk in that it's not going to be how to sorry for those of you who are hoping to find out how to control the swarms and survive the dearth and everything else no this is kind of a soft talk her book is a chronology it goes all the way from people are honey hunters to how we ended up farming bees which is really what we do now and we went through seeking bees and tending then tending bee hives where we found them first. Mm -hmm. Then we started gathering and housing and managing. Okay. It, what was interesting when I went through this book, and I haven't read every word in it. It is, I forget how many thousands of pages. But when you go through it, it's really a history of solutions to beekeeping issues and our evolution in our relationship with bees, which is really fascinating. All the things that have been gone through in the past sort of relate today and we kind of come around full circle with a lot of the interests that people have now for example on on housing people are now going back to older fashioned housing different types of hives and ways to keep bees and different ways to control swarms and uh, the whole migratory hive issue all our tools and equipment are a lot the same but just a little bit different and i thought it was really fun when i went through this book to just sort of look at that. And probably you all have seen some form of cave painting or rock painting, and you've seen something like this. This one down here is the oldest one, I think, that is known of someone collecting feral hive honey. They're actually pretty detailed drawings for some of these are not as old as thousands of years old. We can't really, we often can't really date them, but this is. The best, these, some of these are what the Aborigines did even recently. The way that people portrayed the ladders they used, the climbing up, the bucket or the net that they took, the people at the ground waiting to feast on all the honey. This is a whole crowd here. I suspect that's what that is. I am interpreting. I'm not an archaeologist, but it's kind of fun. Um, some of the drawings are really interesting because they tell us how people did things just like today. Here's someone carrying a torch. That's a torch right there in the hand. And the way those those honeycombs are, are drawn, they're actually as if you were looking at honeycomb, not from the side, like the picture next to it, but actually from below. 
actually it's a very detailed painting when you realize the person is seeing the the honeycomb from below now our relationship with bees isn't just to get the honey and the wax although that's very important we seem to have this spiritual connection religious significance we've been adapting in some ways to each other in terms of the european honeybee we actually have adapted together we've helped it adjust from its tropical and then mediterranean area to climates that are far nor farther north and along the way it's been a part of all of our cultures our relationship with bees you have to look at this book if you get a chance to look at the world history of honey hunters and beekeeping get a chance just to flip through it these these pictures are, are of course grainy because i scanned them i did buy a copy so i'm not totally i don't feel totally guilty about giving a talk and advertising her book because it it's a rather expensive book though it's about 160 dollars but and beekeeping books are about 30 from what i've seen so up here is the pharaoh's titulary i mean the hieroglyphics and if i don't know if you can figure that that is the bee right there this is a picture of a queen bee now that takes some imagination but thousands of years ago already our relationship and sometimes we don't totally understand what uh we're looking at sometimes this is clearly honeycomb it's 6600 years old they figure in one of the oldest lot most long continuously population areas of the world anatolia and we have no idea why they did this but the, to them it must have been something about the bees that honeycomb pattern on those walls do not exist in nature honey and our and bees and the way they live and survive and the way we relate to them and all the good things we get from them that's part of so many religions here's the monkey god giving a gift of uh, honey and comb to buddha here's a religious article a censor it's called incense censor from the mayans they had a bee god down here it's a little unclear what they're doing i i couldn't interpret it but they're putting bees the mayan gods or important people i cannot read mayan are placing bees inside of receptacles some kind of ceremony sometimes if we look at these and we see what they're doing here's the round type of honeycomb honeycomb is in round discs when it comes out of many of the cylindrical hives that were used in the past so these round pieces they look kind of fan shaped from here but those are actually round like pancakes i think there's another picture later where you can see it too the egyptians use cylindrical pottery hives I have a picture of that later but ceremonies to us honey wax has so much significance it became part of our laws really early so she goes through all this in wonderful detail here's like the earliest known beekeeping laws in the hittite code look at that cuneiform writing and then down here the first known transport of bees for beekeeping bees started being translated thousands of years ago here's the first earliest known prescription again in the cuneiform writing about 2000 bc using honey tributes wax and honey were so important that tribute was paid in them from one nation to another and we know that it was huge amounts because of the records for example by roman times it was already huge amounts the egyptians here they are that's a twisted sort of wax candle and this is a odd shaped wax candle i wonder if it's because of the container it was made in and then i assume that's a container of honey there but wax was even more important than the honey although the honey could be carried here's the amphoras that they know were used for honey and shipped across the mediterranean um up into very late even in russia tribute is still being paid here in this one picture in in wax and honey especially wax why is wax so important well if you stop and remember this is hard at one time wax was the more important product than honey yes everyone loved the honey and you had a great feast but what lasted what could be transported easily and traded what did you need 
for the best light, the best purest light. Remember, no electricity, no plastics, no petroleum products. How do you seal, preserve, lubricate, waterproof anything? And if you're depending on leather and skins, it's like a whole different mindset. Mm. And this book kind of helps you get into it. The Candle Factory on the left in in London, 1749. Now, you've probably seen a small uh, candle dipping wheel like this. But that look at that. Look at the size of that. And you think of the number of candles they needed. No electricity yet. Best, cleanest form of light is going to be but probably a beeswax candle until they get really good at developing things like white gas lanterns and such. Here's a funerary portrait. Some of the best artwork and some of the most important artwork. A funerary portrait was one, and Eva Crane goes into a lot of detail. She'll explain things like, you had this portrait made during your lifetime, and then it would live on after your death and perhaps remain in your house. Here's a very, very... Uh, it's, it's uh, hardly recognizable, but this is a hinged wax tablet, as they used for scratch paper, basically, and calculations, and it just, wax was so essential. I mean, you couldn't even easily write without it unless you made paper, and paper was a long, involved process, not like today. In art, the lost wax process is still used today, but it's so many thousands of years old. You have a model, and it can be very detailed. Okay, here's someone is making arrowheads. And they put clay around the wax model very carefully. Then the, the wax is melted out, it's heated enough. The wax is turned upside down and melted out. Then you can pour the metal, the liquid metal, into it. You've lost the wax, but now you have the metal molded object. And then you can just sort of round off the extra pieces. And you'll notice these extra people got very, very good at this. Here's examples. Renaissance Benvenuto. I don't know who that sculptor is on the left. And the wonderful bronzes and metallurgy work that the Chinese did uh, thousands of years ago, too. Okay, I had to put in mead. Mead is quite possibly the first alcoholic beverage. Why? Well, you're dealing with raw honey, and if you are trying to rinse off the wax, you're going to get this honey water, and it's going to ferment. So, I heard this, and it makes sense that it would be the first alcoholic beverage. Honey hunters. Honey hunters all over the world, and they're still doing it today. This is a fairly recent picture of, in the last century of a Nepal honey hunter way up there in the Himalaya mountains, working on a rope ladder that I would never trust my life with, and hanging on using sticks to cut out and pull out the comb, try to get it into the basket. Uh, I'll tell you, amazing. But you know, I think there's a certain amount of, of uh, social status to being a beekeeper. I mean, not that I do this sort of thing. Okay, here are the babinga, the pygmies, one of the pygmy tribes going, this is the kind of ladder they would use to get up the cliffs, or they come up with a tree climbing belt and just a bark, maybe a bark uh, basket to bring the honey down with. Uh, other tribes in, in such in Africa you might use a cow stomach. This is a ladder. I, I would not, again, I wouldn't trust that ladder used in Eastern Europe and a forked stick for pulling honey out. Okay, not only are you getting stung while you do this, but this is this requires a lot of bravery and courage. And I think there's a certain amount of social status. Have you ever dropped into the conversation when it got a little bit boring? You know, you're someplace and you're out of the conversation. You're not interested in whatever shopping they're doing or what restaurants they went to. And so you sort of mentioned something about being a beekeeper. Have you ever pulled that? I have. It just you have instant status. And it, it, I think there is a certain amount of um, aura about beekeeping. Well, bee hunters kept on. Even when they knew how to make hives, it was still free honey and free bees once people started hiving them. So here's the instructions in the 1700s, about 1721, on how to do a bee line. Remember your geometry in high school? 
here's a bee hunter's box over on the right. A bee hunter's box, you would capture a bunch of bees and you would, in at one, one honey source, one nectar source, and they'd probably be from the same hive, right? And then you release them one at a time. And then you'd walk a ways and release another one. And then you could figure out by the bee line that bees take where the hive was. And once you locate it, then you can just take a one-time harvest. That's the honey hunting part. You start becoming a beekeeper when you start tending the bees. And that in in northern in the northern part of Europe, that happened with trees. And I I probably spend more time on the temperate area of Europe because it kind of relates to Western Washington. And here people are doing much what like we just saw the pygmy do, but now they're going up a little bit more tools into the 1900s easily and probably still today. As a matter of fact, I just saw a documentary about the bee woods in Poland and a bee tender there. And he still makes a mark like this. See this mark here on the tree, a tree that says way down low that it's his. And he still makes the doors. And, and then and he's the cavity. He has widened out somewhat. And either there was a natural hive in there or he put a hive in there. Now, it's not just in I don't mean to imply that's just in trees here's a oops here's a marked hive here's a marked hive um, marked with rocks upon cliffs and bees are very any place high up they go for it and actually rocks are good for thermal stability just like th thick walled tree trunks the, and it, this is Eva goes into a lot of detail. It wasn't just one mark to say there's a bee tree here. It was your mark. And in areas, Ukraine and Poland were very, very big on the bee woods and the, the bee tree tenders. They uh, got very advanced. This looks like logging to me. No wonder people who came from Europe became loggers. A lot of them came to the United to the United States, a lot of immigrants from temperate zone Europe, and they were scaling the trees and logging, because that's what these are. If you look down here, those are spikes, like spike boots for a logger. And this is a leg brace, again, with spikes. And then there's the seats that they would use, uh, sort of a pulley, or they'd throw the branch, throw the rope over a branch and have somebody on the ground help them get up. It was fascinating because we still like a free deal. We still we tend to use more ladders. This I thought was real status for beekeepers. Did you know you could get a title, a government job, and um, you you were even the law enforcement in a certain part of a forest? And this person was called the Tidler, and it was I guess you call it late medieval ages, and the reason, okay, he's not carrying the crossbow so he can shoot down beehives. The crossbow signifies that as part of the feudal system, the late feudal system, he has promised so many crossbowmen, so many archers to the feudal lord that grants it to him. And the right to be the supervising forest beekeeper, like game warden, only bees. And it's really interesting to me. The ladders look very much the same. I'm looking at how he's all these people he's supervising. The ladders look a lot the same. Swarm catcher type bags, uh, buckets to carry the honey in. It looks very much like what we do today. In some ways, not much has changed. Security. It's always been a problem between the humans and like bears. This is a really funny one here. This one. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to get that out of the way. Um, that's a bear. This is a very elaborate drawing of how to catch a bear. And then it's rather gruesome because these spikes here, the archer's supposed to shoot the bear down and the bear hits the spikes. This sounds, this sounds like it could never work. But we use electric fences. We have the same problems. 
we have the problems of making our beehives inaccessible. And sometimes the bees just help out. This is a wonderful system of using a cave. The beekeeper actually goes in a door about six feet off the ground, Eva explains, and goes and works the hives from behind, which is one of those things that people are very interested in going back to. The idea of working from behind, the top or behind. And th this person here is doing the same. I think it's like Morocco. I think it's the Middle East. He's opening up the back of the hive. Here's the flight hole. But he's coming in from the side or back. And these are, again, things that we are starting to look at more in, in what we're doing nowadays. We have the same pests and problems. The woodcuts are funny, but it's it's still the same problem. You've got all these bugs trying to get a free meal out of your hive, whether it's the ants or the wax moths, the mice trying to move in for the winter, and those straw skips probably weren't very strong. So despite the shelters they built for their skips, those basket-type beehives, made out of wicker first and then made out of straw later. This is a really interesting scene. The lower picture is getting rid of wax moths and what's really funny is I didn't see this picture until after I put a bug zapper in my bee shed. Has anyone else done that and put it on a timer so it comes on at twilight and zaps the, the wax moths? I think it really helped this year. You know, just set it for a time when your bees are not going to be flying, like just after dark or just early in the morning. I think it helped. And that's what they're doing. They've lit the, can the, can the lanterns. And this is in Flanders, I think, in Europe, for sure. And they're inside the apiary, and they're, I guess, killing the moths as they come in toward the flames, if the moths don't kill themselves. Same problems we have. Bears, wax moths, mice, bugs. Of all the hives that were used in Europe, the one that is sort of puzzling because it lasted so long, but it just worked. And it was like the Langstroth. We are with the Langstroth today, and almost everybody uses the Langstroth. Well, the skip worked in a lot of ways. And this skip on the left, that's actually only the top of a skip, the crown of a skip. They figure it dates to about 200 AD. On the right is one of the, the last, some of the last skips in England in the 1880s. This house, this is these long thatch devices, those are skips the larger size. I think you can see this is just the top, but this is a difference of almost 1700 years. And this one is more wicker and then straw, of course, but to get straw, you have to be doing uh, agriculture where you're mowing and harvesting grain. At the same time that skeps were very popular and stayed popular for all those years and maybe even more since that's the earliest one we found, was 200 AD, but it looks pretty well made already. Horizontal hives all over the world, every place. Horizontal hives, which are now coming back in fashion. Everyone's talking about them. They worked. They had different ways of making them work. This one here, this is the type of roof tile that you see throughout the Mediterranean, those curved uh, Spanish red roof tiles. And this is a stone disc at with holes in it at the at this end and quite often at both ends and one end is the flight end and of course the beekeepers knew as we do that bees tend to put their brood at their main entrance not always but tend to and if you work from the back of the cylinder you can get the honey out with less trouble but everybody did these um all over the world i think this is central america here getting it well off the ground because of the insects, making it hard. This one, yeah, Ethiopia, split cane. Mediterranean islands, the cane was used a lot, and sometimes they'd use dung on the inside to make it smooth and tight, like bee and wasp tight. Many of the same concerns we have. Although this isn't legal anymore, once they, the bee the forest beekeepers started to bring their work home, so to speak. They started to do, to make log hives. And when they came to America, these are gum hives from the gum tree in the Carolinas area. And they're naturally, the heartwood naturally rots out 
I've always wondered if we have as many feral hives in Western Washington where we don't have this kind of tree that rots out, limb breaks off, makes a nice hole, and the heartwood rots out. I just don't think we can have as many feral hives as you would have on the East Coast with the deciduous forest with that heartwood. And the gum tree, and this these log hives are called gums because that's the tree. This one's from North uh, Vietnam, and it's it's a top bar. A lot of these, I don't think they tried to top bar them. I think they cut into the sides and just pulled it out through the cavity. Could be wrong. But in, in Vietnam, here we are with the top bar across. And despite the fact that Langstroth gets the credit, beekeepers knew bee spacing long before somebody got credit for it in 1851. Great way to harvest, and we're going we're going back to this. I put a fair amount about top bars in because people are so fascinated. This man is uh, this is these are called hackles, these straw hats on top of these baskets with top bars, and he's pulling out the comb to examine it. Gorgeous comb, and it's a nice shape, a nice concatenary curve type shape, holding it over the hive just as we do we examine. And that's a very elaborate mask that he's got. Top bars. So in 1965 in England, somebody sort of invents the top bar hive. But it's been around not just in the Kenyan form, but in, and here's, here's an 1834 top bar here. And they even hinge the top. All those things that we are, that we are fascinated. This one has removable hives that come straight up. This one, isn't that an interesting thing? Apparently it hinged. The hives hinged. It wasn't interesting. When people started getting into, in the 1700s and 1800s, coming back into look, taking another look at beehives, with the Industrial Revolution starting to come, the Renaissance is over and the Industrial Revolution is starting to come, they tried everything. Here's a top bar where you can open almost every side. The log hives, I don't know why this is skeps at the top. I don't know. That's, that's wrong, ob obviously. Although there's a skep in this recess, this wall recess here. And these are wall recesses in Greece. And that is Brother Adam of uh, Buckfast Bee fame, the man who developed the Buckfast Bee. More cylindrical hives. I don't remember why. I think this was partly about security. Either you're close to your bees, you hang them so they're harder to get to. You put them up high on a cliff. I think that's why that slide was there. And that's an extra slide. Now, Tom Seeley recorded in his his work, and his work, he's done, I don't know how many decades of work now, on honeybee behavior and feral hives, at least since the 70s, because he did one of his studies in the 70s and was able to go back later because there was a study that actually looked at how many feral hives there were, how big they were, and how far apart they were in a part of the northeast of the United States. And the, but he diagrammed and calculated things out. He's a very detailed person, if you are familiar with any of his work. He's great fun to listen to on YouTube and such. But all this, all this bee space and honey at the top and brood below, all the beekeepers knew this over the years. We teach it in beginning beekeeping classes now, and we take advantage of it just like they did. We know that they knew a lot about bee spacing and how to make bees draw out their comb. One, for example, the top bars, and those top bars uh, I didn't put in any pictures. They had them in pottery jars. Top bars go back thousands of years. The cylindrical ones, if they were wood bark or a hollowed out log, inside we find that they put deep grooves, or still do today, to orient the hives, the comb, in the direction they want the bees to build. And the bees take the hint, just like top bar wedges and fixed foundation frames, they take the hint. You can put wood strips on the insides. Actually, lines of bee wax 
beeswax. The same thing you do where you prime your top bar wedges. And they found that when they did pottery hives, like this one here, this, this is the Egyptians. And these are the cylindrical pottery hives. And here's the round, I promised you another picture, of the round comb. They're cutting it out and pulling out. It's round, and that's what he was carrying in that picture before as an offering to the pharaoh. But inside these clay pots, we have found incisions, sort of like someone took a, a hair comb and drew lines on the inside of the pottery before it dried. And frames, then people moved to frames, but not exactly wired, but they had a way to make the bees draw out the comb inside the frames. The Frula hive is great. Here's the incisions. They know that they, here's, this is a, as if you were flattening it out. What's on the inside of some of these? And sometimes they put two together and they use holes at the ends to suspend them or they use one for the flight hole and then maybe seal the other one up pretty well. And they had all different types of sealing. Uh, stone discs was really common or pottery discs. And usually they approached from the back, keeping the brood nest on one side of the horizontal hive and harvesting more honey off the back. Here's the one where they didn't wire the frames. These are square frames. Seriously, this is in Italy and it's a system called the Ferula Hive. I don't know if it's still in use, but it wasn't within the last century. And what they did was they didn't have wire. They took sticks. So. They just ran like sticks like this, and bees took the hint. Just managed them. And after the honey hunting phase of humans getting to know bees and working out the relationship, yes, we started taking our work home, and home is where the hive is. Why wouldn't you put it right on the sides of your house, especially, you know, for winter or extra shade, protection from the monsoons? Here's Switzerland. I It's got to be some advantages to suspending the hives from the rafters and having them right up against the house some wind or protection and the stingless bees all over central america and south america they hang their hives right under the eaves here's more here's stingless bees i didn't put very much about stingless bees eva crane did a lot of work on all the different types of of honey collected even bumblebee honey you may not have ever realized that anyone ever collected it but those of us with a sweet tooth will do anything, I guess. And our ancestors even kept bumblebee nests and encouraged them and then stole out of that little tiny nectar honey pot that they've got. And the stingless bees make little pots. They don't do combs of honey. We, they, they started working as we do, always worrying about overwintering putting the wall, the hives up on the hall the walls of the house that helped a lot here's japan using probably rice straw i imagine that's what it is they've wrapped this this house and their hive and put it right up on the wall of the house well wrapped for the winter traditional style here's root cellaring now people haven't root cellared bees i don't think ever in this area they probably drown but in the continental part of the united states storing bees in a climate controlled atmosphere which usually was a root cellar you could control the temperature stabilize it somewhat by digging into the ground and those of you who grew up with a root cellar like i did you know what i'm talking about but and i wouldn't be surprised if it's coming back somewhat with the resurgence of interest in gardening root cellars you dug into the ground and then you deep go deep enough and whatever you put in there will be held at the temperature of the ground. Now our ground, if you go down a few feet, in western Washington, for example, tends to hold a lot, uh, I'd guess like 45 to 50 a lot of the year. Even in the summer, the ground doesn't necessarily heat down very far. And then it maintains this during, all, even during the winter, it doesn't necessarily freeze. There's a certain amount of heat that comes out of the ground. And that sounds crazy, but trust me, it works. That's how we stored vegetables. And I bring this up because everything that I kept seeing in the world history of 
honey hunting and beekeeping kept coming back to something we're doing today. We're worrying about wrapping our hives, getting thicker walls, wrapping, we're trying insulations and such. And then there's, I imagine there's some moisture control involved too. And then in the root cellar, what is WSU, Agricultural Extension Service, what are they looking at doing with abandoned apple warehouses over on the east side of the mountains? They're looking at climate control storage. And if you can drop the temperature so that the bees don't do any brood raising, I think CO2 level is involved too. They are, we're looking at plans to store bees and get a brood break from the varroa mite and have the bees come out ready to go in the spring. And this was used quite a bit in the continental United States. And up in, if you read a Canadian beekeeper's blog up in, I think it's, where is he? He's really far north. But a Canadian beekeeper's blog. If you go look, he's way up north in, in Canada and he does climate control too. And CO2 controlled and works really well. So we might even look at going back to that. The ingenuity, it was amazing what people made hives out of, out of everything. Bark, wicker, the skeps, always the skeps coming back to that. The way they made barrels, if they made something else out of it, but then Langstroth, what does he do in 1851? He, he takes uh, champagne boxes apparently, which are a fairly standard size and lumber that's there for the taking and ingenuity. Beekeepers are big on ingenuity. Supering. Supering was one of the things that no sooner do you get the bee in the hive, then now you've got to worry about it swarming. And one of the ways, as we all know, to do swarm control is to increase the amount of room space the bees have. Plus, we can increase our harvest of wax and, and honey. And if we can figure out how to do this removable, we can kill fewer bees. And if we could kill fewer bees, have a nice cluster, this can all lead to increased overwintering. So people, these these first supers with skeps were called eeks or imps. And sometimes this diagram, no, I don't know if you can really see, but this diagram has like little prongs and they made sure that they were firmly fixed together with these pegs or prongs. This I couldn't resist putting in. This is the, the 1789 flow hive. And I've heard people say they do this to this day. They take jars, they upend them right above an active hive early, if there's a really good flow on, and they get the bees to fill up the jars with comb and honey, and then pour in some extra honey too, I'm sure, on top. And, and this, this was, I think, a fun thing. I think this is a lot like a flow hive. It's an observation, it's fun, it's entertaining, it's a conversation piece. And in the 17 and 1800s, people really got into beekeeping as a hobby and as an interesting, you might be able to make a technological uh, contribution by coming up with the best kind of hive. That just seems to be something that draws people to beekeeping. There are those who just want to do the beekeeping and those who just can't resist that innovation. If I try, I've got to try something new this year. And maybe that's a good attitude as a beekeeper. Supers. Supers on a horizontal hive are extensions. And this man, these are not wood hives. He's going around putting like these wood buckets here. He's taking wood extensions and sticking them on with two wood struts that sticks into these horizontal hives to increase the space. Basically, he's supering. With the cylindrical hives, they found that, and they have found in the archaeological digs, that they had been doing this for a long time. If it was a good season, you just kept adding on another piece of, we think of it as like pipe. This is, with skips, drumming was the way you could get the bees to move out of what hopefully was mostly full of honey. Actually, there was one other thing I didn't mention on the last picture, this one. One thing they found out was a virtual queen excluder. The way they set this up, 
they made a narrow hole. It was covered, it was warm, but they found that the queen would not want to go through the narrow hole. She would lay down here. So they essentially made a brood chamber and a super, a honey super. Drumming is hitting the, tapping the sides of the hive rhythmically and the bees will move upward. It, I got to try this someday. I'm sure I've heard of a couple people that have. Now you've got so many hives, you need to start thinking about where you're going to store all these. These, how are you going to maintain this many? And all kinds of apiary systems. Again, skeps. People didn't quit with skeps. And also, you, there were a number of reasons why you put it together. You put it together for protection, security, and in the case of skeps, a number of types of skep farming were intended to allow the bees to swarm, settle nearby, and then you'd catch them and put them in a new skep. Or you'd know they were really close to, by watching them, you'd know that they were really, really close to swarming, and you'd get the next skep out. But they, they really let them swarm on purpose and just simply caught them. Now you've got a whole bunch of hives, and the forage is going to run short at some time of the year. So the evolution between humans and bees was, we're going to have to, if we want the honey and we want this number of hives and we want to expand, we need to migrate. Migratory beekeepers. Done every way you can. This man's doing it on foot. And this is, again, in, like in the last century. He is carrying four, I think it is, I think you count one, two, three, four horizontal hives on his back. And he's just going to backpack it up to the mountain meadows. Uh, if camels, I didn't get a picture of this, but... Eva mentions it, so I trust her. Uh, by boat on the Nile, along some of the rivers, and it wasn't just the Nile, there were a number of other rivers named too, and in Europe. And people would seal up their hives, it must have been at night, take them by boat, and stop along the way at various crops. They knew when they were going to be blooming. And so it, they didn't just take them and put them in a different destination. Sometimes I'm sure they did. But quite often, they knew the blooming schedule. Their phenology sense was so good, they could increase their yields and make it worth their while to do it. And if you can take a skep, this is a skep turned upside down, covered over with cloth, and you can pack this on mules. Probably could take it anywhere this way, but especially on mules, this is going to be easy to move up the mountain, up the mountainside, Sicily being rather mountainous. And... Again, by boat, even in Roman times, and probably even earlier than that, they would sail from island to island, those little Grecian islands that fill up the Mediterranean, is that the Aegean Sea over there? And they would go taking their hives from island to island. And then we got in, of course, got bigger. And we had horses, horse-drawn carriages. and But you still had to often have somebody mind them. And here's a woman spinning, probably staying overnight with her hives when the flow is on in this particular place that she took. They took the, the horse-drawn carriage. This is later. And these still exist even today. And there's a lot of fascination with the bee hives and the bee houses. And a lot of those were on... They were on wheels like this. Migratory apiaries all over the world, and they have been huge. Langstroth made it easier, but it was happening well before that. If you can imagine pine honey do honey, 100,000 hives, that's, I think, this picture, whoops, I think this picture got covered up. This picture is the pine honeydew. And apparently up to 100,000 hives would be taken. Not all in boxes. I think I think a lot of that was in, was in cylindrical hives. In cashmere, the picture, I'm sorry, that rearranged when I changed the background. There's a truck unloading langstroths in cashmere. Eucalyptus plantations. Apparently, 
get very good honey from in Australia from eucalyptus. All these places that we have migrated and continue to. Now, in the 17, 1800s and even today, beekeeping became something that could be a hobby and ornamental as well as you could apply the latest technology. It was the industrial revolution and the modern times. People started doing all sorts of things. On the right is the famous leaf hive by Huber, the blind beekeeper scientist who wrote some of the earliest writings, very detailed and actually figured out that the queen is a queen and the queen mates with the drones outside the hive, that sort of thing. And he made a lot of very detailed observations. And a lot of other people did separate frames that could be moved, slid out in this case. Uh, I think this is back opening too. It's just fascinating. Eva collected all of this. Here's some more back opening hives even starting with a log hive, it's really still a top bar. And then these are frames, actual slide out frames. But the hobby and the curiosity and the interest in science and technology, here's glass hives with an insulator that goes over at night for darkness and for insulating. They knew they needed to do that. I don't know how successful these were, but people were just enjoying the scientific discovery. In 1965, this is one of Carl von Frisch's hives. Carl von Frisch, if the name seems familiar, was the only person I know of who received the Nobel Prize directly for beekeeping research. So you should remember that name. It's an important trivia name. You might be on Jeopardy. You need to know that. The only beekeeping researcher awarded the Nobel Prize was Carl von Frisch. People went crazy with lumber. Was the age of lumber and hinges and they were seeking the same thing that people seek today when they're doing experimental hives. The hobbyist, the researcher, the person who likes to observe nature and observe bees, just likes keeping bees. Trying out all these different octagonal hives, uh, the horizontal hives, the upright hives, looks like a double deep nu de nucleus, some of this. Jancha, he did a lot of work. I think he also published books with bees. And that's a deep, sort of like a deep horizontal. And then you could put a super on top. And I think he just allowed adjoining holes here, figuring the bees would move up. And there was development in smokers. I mean, this, you had, okay, you may not have recognized this as a smoker, but that's what it is. From men, from a long time ago. It is it's pottery. And, um, how long ago? I don't remember on that one. But smoking, people would actually smoke a real pipe with tobacco in it. This is one of those clay pipes. And you poof, you actually blew the smoke into the hive from directly from the pipe. Here's another one, another pipe. And this is one of the face pieces, probably wire probably wire mesh, and you connected that into the hoods that almost everybody already wore in the temperance zone. And that was a lot of the people started to get into bee protection, maybe for the same reason that we have problems with protection in Western Washington, the fact that it's so rainy. Maybe they don't always have perfect weather for opening up beehives either. But this was sort of the evolution of the smoker, even a full fledged bellows that looks like a bit much. Personal protection evolved too, especially as it became a hobbyist thing. Here's woman child bee dresses. Here's again another pipe and another face um, veil, but it's only a face plate like. Here with the strings, those infamous strings on tie on veils. This looks very familiar. That looks like a type of veil that we have too. So Langstroth. And the fact that he's part of this momentum, he's riding on the crest of the wave and he gets the credit. I know there were half a dozen other people and Eva Crane has quite a bit of information on them. For example, this man whose name I probably won't pronounce correctly, Gierzon, 
and here's his hive. He worked, but his was, I think, more complicated. And Langstroth's, even though it might have been more complicated to start, could be simplified. And this double deep movable frame system, interchangeable, and the infamous B space that apparently, from what I see in all the top bar and horizontal hives that appear in the past, most beekeepers figured it out and figured out how to use. Langstroth gets the credit. He's just the right time and the right place. So with Langstroth, we go to large scale. Forklifts, semis. It becomes possible. They're thinner walled hives. The extractors. Okay, here's holes in the pottery. This time it's at the bottom of the pot. This is basically a honey extraction the strainer. This is a single frame extractor. You spin this pole and you centrifugally fling the just just like this big radial extractor. Only this is a tangential one frame at a time extractor. And with Langstroth, with everything being modular, I tell people it's like Legos. Think of it like Legos when I'm doing my beginning classes because everything fit together so well. Now everyone's interested in having bees. Bees become something that doesn't have to, you don't have to own the bee woods. You don't have to be the titler who has a title and a government job. You don't have to be one of the people in Nepal who climbs up incredible cliff faces on rope ladders, we've come a long ways in beekeeping. We don't have to do that anymore. So now we have, you can order the packages. We know how to ship bees. Bees are incredibly adaptable and let us do so much when we're managing them. Queen cages, but don't forget, this is, we've been doing this all along. It's just that Langstroth makes it easy to do in large quantities. And here's package bees from 1881, the same kind of basically the package like we're buying today in 2020. It's, I feel like sometimes we're coming around full circle because here is 1902, says 1902 queen cages from Eritrea and Ethiopia. And there's the queen cages as we've been evolving them today. All this standardization, it's allowed us to, to scale up as the monocultures appeared in the 1900s. For better, for worse, it, it has changed the world. And yet, I find when I'm reading through Eva Crane's book, we're kind of coming back around. We're kind of revisiting history as we look more at top bars. We want to see what's going on in our hives, observation hives flow hives, we want to play with it, specialty hives. I think we're going around full circle back through the history of beekeeping. And I like this last quote, this odd little hive that I can't really understand why it exists. I read about the Wari hive and it's cute and it's interesting when people talk about it. But what I really like about the Wari hive, it sort of symbolizes this, let's go back and try this and that. But the, it's the abbot, Emile Waré. His opinion on beekeeping was that it's a moral activity as far as it keeps one away from cafes and low places. So all you beekeepers out there, just remember, it's a moral activity, what you're doing. And you're helping the environment and having a great time, I hope. And I think that's all I have. I have some other odd slides. But that was really what I wanted to say about Eva Crane's wonderful book that she wrote. And she wrote many books and she worked with uh, the IBRA, and I would have to look it up, International Something Research Association, the International Beekeeping Research Association still exists today if you look it up online. So thank you very much for listening to all this. Any questions? Well, I oh, just, I just like, like to start, start it off by saying, by saying thank, thank you. you. <laughs> that was that awesome. Was awesome. I learned I quite a bit myself. myself. And it is kind of fluff in a way, I think, but it's kind of nice fluff. It's kind of, you know, we're all beekeepers, even 15,000 years ago.
Jeff, I can see the chat. Are there anybody in the queue? Uh, so uh, you can, if people want to type their question, they can do that. Um, we can watch the chat, or you could selectively raise your hand and unmute yourself, and then we'll call you on you. Uh, if you the little at the bottom of your the presentation, there's a little hand symbol. Uh, you can click on that if you want to. So we're not all talking at once. I don't, is anyone in the chat? I don't see any chat questions either. Well, there's no chat questions. Everybody on the internet has been talking about tanging, and I figured I had to put up one slide about tanging. I don't see anything yet. Uh, do you want to talk about how tanging works? Uh, yeah, um, it's just that people have been talking about you make a noise by banging pots and pans and you can get the bees to settle down. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's really true, but tanging is such an old custom. And in Europe, if your swarm, if the swarm emerged from your apiary, it belonged to you. That meant you could go across other people's property as long as you could keep the swarm in sight. Well, obviously, you don't want to be crossing somebody's property and they pull out the shotgun or the equivalent thereof, even in medieval times. So it's probably a good idea to bang a pot if you decide to do that and cross mm -hmm. someone's property. I think it was more of a, I am not trespassing. I am a beekeeper. I have a legal right to chase my swarm. So I, I don't know if it actually settles the bees, but I think it actually has to do with property rights, which is like having the rights to to have beehives and keep them in certain woods is something that is hereditary or they have quite a system of laws in Europe about the use of property. And the other thing that people are talking about now came up in a number of places on Facebook and the internet was the telling the bees tradition. The idea that the bees are part of the family. And I found that we brought it into America a certain amount. And there's a picture there, the lower left, where the man has put black drapes on some of his hives. And he tells the bees not to worry, not to swarm, because if they swarm, bad luck will hit everybody. And then the picture is of a widow who is telling, going around with her child telling the bees that the owner has died. It was a interesting custom, I guess. Well, it seems like if the beekeeper dies in spring, swarming is inedible. Well, maybe it was a way not to feel so bad about it or to explain why they swarmed because <laughs> there were so many people trying to explain why their hive swarmed. And I put a new super on. I, uh, I, I was sure they had enough room. I think six weeks of rain, some of them said, we're from California, we're getting out of here. I didn't put this one in. This is in interesting if no one has a question. Bees as weapons. Isn't this terrible? They're wasting perfectly good beehives and they're using this device on the left to hurl the beehives up on the castle. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? What waste? So these are hives. These are pictures that weren't really related to anything else, but they were kind of interesting. She has so much interesting information in this book. Do you have a like a library for your association? Could you ever afford, you know, close to two hundred dollars to buy a book? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I I splurged and I, I looked really really hard, and got this book. This is a funny, the funny attitude they had toward bees. I think beekeepers who kept the bees knew long before people like the Shakespearean actors knew that it was the queen that laid the eggs. I think, I suspect that Shakespeare's time, it was nice to have this image of the king bee 
and then the officers, soldiers armed in their stings. This is really interesting reading this. And then using this to say this is the way the world should be in a monarchy with an aristocracy where there are classes of people and you stay within your class and do your duties. You contribute to the whole and pay the taxes and never complain. Okay, if nobody's going to say anything, whoops, this is really interesting. Do you know when bees got to the West Coast? Uh, anybody who's lived here and, and has grown up here, we hear all our lives about cardinals and the, the real bluebirds and the monarch butterflies, and they never get it to this side of the mountains. What well, was the same for the honeybees? They may have arrived here on the continent in 16, I don't know, 29 or something. Early 1600s is first recorded. They were brought in, but they couldn't cross the Rockies like a lot of things. They ended up coming around the horn. Mm. And this man, Cotton, and Eva Crane describes it either in the world history she describes it, or she describes it in her book, Honey, which is a whole nother great book. Well, you want a good, another good book report? I, I, I'm not going to say I have genius ideas myself, but I just really enjoy it when someone else puts it all together. And, and she does. And honey, everything you never even thought to ask about honey, even down to charts of how the nectar, what percentage sugar one is opposed to the other, and mm -hmm. pollen pictures and such. It, it's really incredible what she does with her book on honey. But this one... A man named Cotton decided to get bees around, and this is one of the ways they did it. On the sailing ship, he took, he put it in a water bath. He put one barrel inside of another. So here's the skeps, I guess. I guess he's got these skeps, and then he's got this, like, double, it's like a water, um, water jacket. That's what I would call it. And he's got them, and he's, I don't remember if he had ice, but he's keeping them as cold as he can. And emptying it out, I think that's probably a spigot for emptying the water out and refreshing it with cold water. And he got them around without them overheating. And he knew enough about bees. So it's about 1850, I think, that we finally get bees on this side of the Rockies. California and Oregon probably first, of course. Well, California first. And then Seattle's the other major seaport. Mm -hmm. Eli, you have kept the audience um, intact. No one has hung up. It's very interesting to see that the audience is really still with us. Um, and your information is fabulous. I was just wondering if um, it would be okay to open up um, to questions about bees and anything people are experiencing in their hives that they have been keeping to themselves until now. Um, we always end these meetings with a general conversation about what's going on. And um, maybe there are some good uh, questions and conversation in that direction. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Everybody should be thinking about the dearth and we're practically to, or we're going we're gonna to have to get ready for winter before we know it. And it rained all spring. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's been a crazy season. So um, if, if anyone has anything in that direction, go ahead and um, raise your hand and don't don't feel that that isn't OK. Oh, go. Yeah, it looks like uh, I'm just looking at the top. It looks like Brian has a question. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, so I'm a first year beekeeper. And in the last two weeks or so, I have been on the steep learning curve of making many, many mistakes, but my biggest problem right now is yellow jackets. And I know we were warned at the last meeting to put up our robin screens. Um, and I did, and then I took someone else's advice who told me he had never lost bees to robbing and never lost bees to yellow jackets, and I was being silly. And y'all were right. Um, and I have personally swatted over 80 yellow jackets in the past six days mechanically and killed another 20 with traps. Um, 
So my question is, among those of you who have maybe made do-it-yourself traps, I've seen a hundred different types on the internet. What works for bait for baiting the traps for, for yellow jackets in, in Washington? Or any other general yellow jacket advice? There's three types of bait. You can buy the pheromone bait. Um, I don't know if that's, if that's better early season or late year. Uh, but they have the pheromone traps you can get from the store. Um, as far as what most of the yellow jackets out there are looking for right now is meat. Uh, so meat traps tend to work. Um, uh, and the third type of bait you can do is like some sort of syrup trap, but you're going to appeal to the honeybees if you make it too strong. Okay, I will try the meat method. I've actually got about five different traps of four different designs in the backyard and uh, the ones with juice and wine have trapped zero and the one with meat has tra with cat food has trapped five. Um, so my my very limited experience agrees with yours um, and I'll do more of that. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's a lot of it's time of year too, but right now it's the meat. Uh, later in the season when it gets drier, uh, the the syrup traps might be more appealing because they'll, they'll also get. So the adult yellow jackets need to also consume high carbohydrates. So they'll visit flowers to get some nectar. Uh, but what they're out hunting for at the same time is meat to take home to feed their young. So meat is really appealing right now to them when there's still nectar sources out there. As it gets drier, the syrup will become more appealing as will also become as appealing as the meat. Brian, and you put your robbing screen back on, right? Oh, oh, hell yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, so if you have a sick hive um, next to a real strong hive or your neighbor has a sick hive, they're feeding the yellow jacket population. And then, um, yeah, once they're dead and they've built up and your strong hive could be vulnerable. Yeah. So it's. In general, if you put one hive out in the middle of nowhere, yellow jacket and it's healthy, yellow jackets probably won't take it over. But in our heavily, you know, our, our cities are just full of garbage for yellow jackets to eat and feast on. So those nests can get really big and they can take on full healthy hives. Yes, I have two hives. Both were devastated by yellow jackets. The only good news I can turn out of this is that I apparently, I have a brood break. Um, now that I've beaten back the yellow jackets and found no larvae between three days old and, and five, uh, there was still a bunch of cap brood and the queen's still alive and she's laying again, or still, I guess. Um, maybe this will keep the varroa under, you know, better control. It may be that they stop laying because there's a pollen dearth right now. And so you'll want to make sure that you look to see if there's pollen in your colony and if not to add pollen patties. I will add another pollen patty, but uh, last I looked, there was there was a bunch of everything. Um, I don't want to open the hive right now, uh, but I'll look again next weekend. Yeah. And then Right now, when the yellow jackets are bad, it's a really good idea to either use an inner cover or a piece of plywood and put it over the boxes that um, you've got stacked next to your colony so that yellow jackets can't help themselves while you're working inside your colony. Oh, you mean when, when you're doing an inspection, you take yep. a box off, you, you keep it covered. Exactly. Thank yeah, or a, a sheet or something, just keep it something. covered, yeah. I follow you. Thank you. I hadn't heard that before or thought of it. So like I said at the beginning of this, the, the learning curve's been tough this year. And the, the sheet also, I mean, now that we're headed into the dearth, um, your hot, yes, you have two hives and they should like each other, but if you open one up, the other one might start robbing it. Uh, so the sheet also helps with robbing. You, so you don't trigger a robbing event. Again, thank you. Other questions? Nothing in chat. 
I have a question for Eli then. Um, in all your reading of these books, what did they used to do for Yellow Jacket? We've got night traps for moths and we have bear traps, but what about Yellow Jacket? I don't know. I didn't run across that. And, and one of the Yellow Jackets we have a problem with is the European Yellow Jacket. Or the German, I think they call it. So, what did they do? They did small entrances. One thing that I know Europe does not agree with us, and if you look back at a lot of uh, the pictures of European hives, they do not like the fact that we have big, huge entrances open. And we tend to do that year-round. And they, the landing platforms, they don't believe in that. And, for example, I just talked to someone who just built lion's hives, which is very popular now. Like I said, we're going first full circle. I didn't have a picture in here. I'll have to look again because it may not have been called that in Eva's books. But the lion's hive is a thick-walled, you never move it, huge, sort of like a an extra deep, long hive. It's a special type, it's a, it's a deeper frame. But in that, there's no landing board. They're slits like there are for some top bars. And when the bees go in, even when they go inside, they're not supposed to land inside. The opening is high enough up that they are never supposed to use the bottom couple of inches in the hive, which he was saying keeps from disease, from them picking up disease. For example, if mites fell to the bottom, instead of a screen bottom board, they're like two inches farther down. It's an interesting theory. He says his grandfather in Romania has great success with these lion's hives. So I think the entrance thing, they, they reduce it way down. They never get into these big entrances that we do. And part of that is because we have these really warm climates inside our 50 states. Even though if you look at the top 10 honey producing states, it's not so much down there. Number one is North Dakota. I think South Dakota's in the top five. I was just looking at the 2018 report when I was doing the research for this. And I think it's the entrance size is the biggest thing they do. But I'll look. If I find anything, I'll email Tracy, okay? If I find a better answer. But they don't believe in these large entrances. They look at ours and are horrified. And our landing platforms. Why would you make a robbing platform? Yeah, and I, I can actually relate to a lot of the stuff in this presentation because I'm a top RP keeper and I've been doing that for since 2011. Uh, so and my entrances are higher up. Uh, so, you know, you have to go in at the, sort of at the top of the comb and so there is no landing. It's just a cork sized hole. So it's much harder to wage an attack against one of those hives. Yeah, um, and if you, you look at where what the yellow jackets do when they're trying to sneak in. They 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 go around under the eaves and everything, right? You you can tell when you've got robbers or wasps trying to come in because you suddenly see this activity under the telescoping lid eaves, and then 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 they try for the front and then they try to land. Hmm. Yeah, the top bars. It's like it's all coming full circle. We're going back to a lot of what she talked about: basic beekeeping. Other questions? Hi, uh, this is Anne. Do you hear me? Yes. Hi, I've just joined uh, the Puget Sound Beekeepers Association and I just, I loved Eli's presentation. Thank you, Eli. It was wonderful. Um, one of the comments that came out was that the Bees are ravenous during this time of year. Uh, I don't have any beehives yet, <laughs> but I have a lot of uh, lavender and oregano and lots and lots of flowers. The bees are just loving it. And this might sound kind of a silly question, but it intrigued me. I was wondering, um, regarding feeding the bees, can we feed them um, sugar water even though there is no hive to help them out? And 
how do you do that? <laughs> so uh, how do you, I mean, people have hummingbird feeders out there that they make too strong. So they inadvertently feed the bees that way. Um, I, I feel like you're going to uh, be feeding the yellow jackets quite a bit as well. If you're, if you put sugar water out, even as a beekeeper, you know, I wouldn't want to ever put a thing of sugar water in my yard because you're going to, I'm going to get all the hives going to that. Um, you know, usually we, we, we put the sugar water inside the hive in a real safe spot. Um, but you know, I, 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 I don't know what other people think, but you know, if you're just, uh, a nature lover and you you feed the birds you feed the hummingbirds and you want to feed some bees you know and waste you know throw some money at sugar i don't think it would hurt it's not going to last long once they find it though they'll they'll you have every hive in the neighborhood there and they'll drain a gallon in a day or more Oh, that's very interesting. Okay, maybe I'll just leave them with the flowers. There's plenty of them there for them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that once if you're if you're putting sugar water out there, it's you, you're going to be just throwing money into the air because they're going to every hive in the neighborhood will find within three miles will find that, and they can drain a lot of sugar water quickly if it's out exposed like that. Thank you. Just uh, uh, never feed honey. If you don't buy honey from the store and feed that, uh, that would be a no-no because that, that could have a disease in it that we don't when it run into, but it could make it hive sick in the area. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think everyone's scared to ask their questions, Tracy. Because you're so scary, Jeff. <laughs> well, last month, last month we had an hour of questions. I know. So everyone's hives are ready for winter. Everyone made it through the summer. Everyone's got their treatment plans ready. Go, Brian. He's not shy. He raised his hand again. Okay. Brian? Yeah, uh, if no one else wants to talk, I, I can share a story of my own stupidity, really, uh, for, for any of the other beginners. Um, uh, I mentioned the Yellow Jackets earlier, one of the several things that I did wrong that attracted them. Uh, last week on Monday, I my wife came across a, a post on Craigslist from someone who was getting rid of some some boxes and some frames and the price was right. And I ran out to the Redmond and, and bought them from them and had a big stack of them in my backyard. Um, one of them, only one, was a box that had some previously used frames that still had a bunch of honey on them from their last extraction. And I thought, hey, my bees might like that. Um, so I had a bottom board and, and a, a lid and, and just made it basically a one frame box and sat it on, on a table 20 feet from my hives. Uh, 48 hours later, we observed Honeybee Fight Club. Um, bees were landing there by the hundreds and taken off in all directions, and most of which were not heading back to my hives. And there were these battles between bees and between bees and yellow jackets on the front step. Um, and it took me a day or two to realize that what I had done was draw in, I had rung the dinner bell. And that is probably a big reason why that when I took that box away, um, and the yellow jackets were already in the backyard and in, in their hundreds is again why I, I ended up fly swattering them by the score over the next three days and, and trying to fight back what they've done to my hives. Yeah, the other thing you create is uh, potentially robbing by inviting other hives to come attack your hives. If they come there thinking there's free food, they're going to try to barge their way into your hives to take food. because. You know, now they're committed 
when she flew out there that they have to take something back. So next, you're not doing that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no, so the, I, I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, the first thing I hear when someone says I bought something on Craigslist in its old bird home, I worry because you don't know what diseases those hives had or why they technically got out of it or if they were skilled enough beekeepers that even have identified a disease in the first place. So, you know, it, boxes are usually pretty safe. You can uh, quickly um, burn, sanitize them. Um, frames, I don't know if I would want to use foam I got from anyone ever. Um, I'd probably cut that out and do, you know, put a new foundation in or whatever, but I probably would have swapped that out. But if you wanted to clean them, uh, the best way to do it was just put the empty box on top of your stack. So it's, yeah, it's sealed as part of the inside of the hive and they'll just go up and they'll clean that out. I, I failed to hear like four or five really important words out of that last sentence. It sounded like you said, put something on a hop on a deck or something. What was that? Oh, uh, if, I don't know if I'm still breaking up, but yeah. So uh, the, the best way would have been to uh, put that empty box on top of your stack uh, and let your, you know, so it's see as part of your, you're just extending the attic of your hive, basically. So it's all sealed and protected. So the house bees will go up and clean it. And then you can pull that off later. Uh, I follow you. Thank you. Next time. Right. So another example of that, Brian, is when I take my honey supers and extract the honey, I put the wet frames back into the box. And then I put it on top of one of my colonies that I want to feed the honey back to. On top, I should put it on top of the inner cover and then put the lid on so that no other bees except those in that colony can get in there. And then they clean out all the extra honey and pull it down into their into the main colony. And after a couple of days, I can just take that off and store the box without worrying about a robbing event. I like it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have a question from Jordan. Hi, um, I am a new member and um, I don't have any hives, but I do have an interest in learning. My question is um, in looking at the website, I know that COVID has put a lot of um, people updating info, et cetera and lessons, et cetera, online. So would you say that the, the uh, website is up to date and the various monthly lessons that are listed, those are the topics? Um, and then maybe I can just get started at the Honeybee 101 or um, what do you think? Uh yeah, uh, so the lessons under like the meeting lessons are a supplement to the actual beginner lessons for the meetings. Uh, you would probably be better jumping over to our YouTube channel and watching like the March, April, May, and June beginner lessons that we posted. Because uh, okay. then you'll get, the, um, you'll get the slides with the actual presentation. Okay, so YouTube for March, April, May, and June. Yeah, uh, okay. you know, yeah, I'm assuming we're just going to keep doing this because <laughs> COVID never seems to end, but uh, for the rest of the year. So then we'll have almost a whole year of video intro lessons as well. But yeah, I mean, you you have the slides, you can read them. They're sort of relevant, but it's nice to have the, the commentary that goes with those slides. Yes. OK, and thank you, Eli, for your presentation. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. So Penn State Online was offering free beginner beekeeper um, online classes as well. I don't know if they still are free, but you could check that out. And then a, a couple of really good uh, websites to read on are scientificbeekeeping.com. And then the Honeybee Suite is also excellent information. And Rusty Burley actually is a master beekeeper and lives in Olympia. So a lot of her information is uh, local and it's very relevant and reputable. And she's a wonderful writer. What was the second suggestion? 
the honeybee sweet, and it's sweet like a hotel suite. Eli, any recommendations that you've been sharing with your club for online learning? Um, well, I, I've still been, we've still been doing the beginner classes. I just did, we just did a set of three times through the WASBA beginner level class, and our next one's going to be Apprentice. So we've been doing that. Yeah, the Honeybee Suite, that's just a great website. You just put it in, anything in, in the search. It can be anything, like feeding or... <clears throat> yellow jackets or anything and she has a good article on practically anything and she writes it so well um, I, I recommend when people do YouTube I say go north of like I don't know latitude 45 or something don't go south and and believe you can do whatever they do in Alabama Georgia <laughs> I mean I love those southern accents but it's just unrealistic a lot of what they're doing just does not relate to Western Washington, especially. Yeah, and you know, anyone can do a YouTube channel and sound like they know what they're doing. And uh, yeah, we have neighborhood captains. So, you know, go to the website, look up the neighborhood captains and find a local captain near you. And I know with COVID, it's a little bit hard to ask if you can join them for some inspections and, you know, learn from them by watching them work their hives or assisting them. Um, it's, I mean, this is a great way to learn um, why we're not doing APRA work parties at the moment. Uh, for anyone curious about those two URLs, I put those in the chat for Honeybee Suite and uh, Scientific Beekeeping. Uh, so I'm Kev not, oh, go ahead. oh, sorry. I'm not able to access the chat. I don't see any option. So, yeah, where you raise your hand, next to that's a little conversation button. Yeah, under more actions, there's no chat option. Oh, uh, do you see the little, you, you saw where you raise your hand, that little uh, button? Yes. Next to that's like a, uh, uh, like a cartoon dialogue box. Do you see that? I see the three dots. Oh, maybe people don't. It might be my, this is through my school's teams. So they may have some weird setup. I apologize, Kevin. I interrupted before <laughs> you. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just kind of be sweet and scientific beekeeping. You can Google those pretty readily. Uh, Kevin? Um, yeah, you can hear me, I assume. Yep. Uh, th yeah, th this is Captain Wallingford. And um, he took the words right out of my mouth about uh, scientific beekeeping.com. Um, that's the site for uh, really kind of geeky stuff. And uh, two of the um, series that I uh, that he wrote um, several articles about, one is called Understanding um, Colony Buildup and Decline. And that one basically is a, um, a series on what the colony goes through through a whole year of its existence and what is normal. And the other series uh, that's quite impressive is his series on uh, Varroa. And uh, I forget what the name of that series is, but I think it's something like the Varroa problem. And there's about 17 articles that, you know, are one right after another. Um, and a couple of a couple other things that I um, was going to say, um, the anti-robbing screens are called anti-robbing screens rather than anti-yellow jacket screens. Basically, what happens when you put such a screen up is that uh, foreign bees uh, that don't live in the hive, they generally try to go straight into the entrance. And so, um, of course, they're not going to be uh, successful running up against the screen. Uh, meanwhile, the bees that live in the hive uh, will find its way around to any open entrance. So, um, so uh, being a barrier against yellow jackets is kind of a side benefit for anti-robbing. 
And uh, the other comment I, um, I guess I could say is that um, I personally keep my entrance reducers on all year round because basically, um, well, for instance, Thomas Seeley says the ideal uh, size for an entrance is about, I think it's one and a half or two inches um, in, in, uh, in diameter, a hole. So any um, entrance with um, that size is going to work very well for the bees because they're pretty effective at protecting that kind of uh, hole entrance. So I think that's all I got to say. Um, Interesting. No. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yes. Yeah, no, as a, a top barbie keeper, I recall it because I remember having a conversation with about it. It's a one inch, in natural cavities, you're looking for a one inch size hole. Um, and it doesn't have to be one hole. It could be one inch size hole spread over 10 little holes. that makes sense. So it doesn't have to be one single entrance. It could be 10 little entrances that are single B-sized. And they'll close and open those as they need them. I don't know, uh, maybe this is an observation. In, in top bar hives, I see them propolize over the cork size holes. Do you ever see that in the Langstroth where they start propolizing those giant entrances at the bottom? Not at the bottom, but I've had several colonies propolize over the upper entrance. Or any, if I have um, emery shims in, sometimes I'll start propolizing those holes too. Yeah, I would imagine they'd do that. I've just never seen an, like a lower entrance ever propolized up like mm -hmm. I see in a top bar hive. I haven't either. Uh, other questions? Oh, uh, Jeff? Yeah, I have a question about landing areas in a uh, tub water. I have a, have a uh, about a two foot diameter tub and I keep filled with water, and I have a, a large floating uh, pad on top with holes cut in it to have extra area for, for bees. None of the bees land on the, the uh, floating cover. They all tend to crowd up on the edge and fall in, or uh, you know, they land, and then they have to walk head down in, into the tub. Is is there some other way to do this other than fill it up with rocks, which reduce the amount of water that's in the tub? I think rocks are probably your best bet. I, I don't use them because I have a little running stream out front year round, so spoiled. Yeah, they like that safe, the safe uh, waiting areas. Um, yeah. Well, what was surprising was that the floating cover is, is very safe. It, but it's white. I don't know if they, I mean, they, I thought they bees saw white pretty well. So I, I wasn't sure that they uh, were, were staying away from it. But, you know, there, there may be 100 bees around the edge of the tub, but uh, maybe only one that's on the, on the floating cover. You know, the other thing that I've seen people use pretty effectively are, is a, a five-gallon bucket uh, with a lid. And they just drill holes in each of those little sections around and they fill the bucket up with water, they tip it over, and then you have a whole bunch of little tiny pools along the lid and the bees love that too. So, so it's basically like a feeder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think for your floating device that you made, could you cover it with moss? A thin layer of moss? I could easily put leaves on it. And I think or, leaves or would moss. blow around, but if you could like, uh, create some traction and like like little nails or like staples and pieces of moss on there. They yeah, love okay. to drink the water out of moss. Um, it's like, it acts like a sponge and it soaks mm -hmm. it up and it's really safe for them. So that that does appeal for them. Yeah. So maybe well, I, just try to make your floating device more um, natural okay. feeling to them. Yeah. Well, I have noticed that they like to, uh, when I fill it and I slop water over, 
uh, they get down on the vegetation and uh, on the dead leaves and, and sticks that are around and they'll they'll be walking all over it, uh, lapping up a little bit of water. So that it, it is true that they do like to not necessarily drink right out of the pool, but they'll take it off of vegetation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the, the safest safer. place they can get it. So mm-hmm. they, don't accident, they don't want to fall in and drown. Yeah. Well, that's why the landing on the lip of this thing, <laughs> kind of aiming down, is uh, is pretty precarious, and I do I do lose a few. Yeah, um, I find I've got some. Um, I've got my my pond's a little bit bigger than yours, but I've got like floating plants and allergy in there. And like if the raccoons come up and they pull some of that out and it's hanging over the the sides or the edges, they love to land on that. It, it acts like a sponge and it soaks it up, and it's really easy to grip onto. Okay. I'll give it a shot. Yeah, Jeff, you just reminded me. I saw a picture of somebody that threw a shop towel, uh, a fuzzy shop towel, over the lip of their bucket, and the bees all landed yeah. on the shop towel. Uh, yeah, because that would wick it away. That, that'd be exactly. another thing. I hadn't hadn't thought about doing that. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah, anything that's easy for them to grab onto that stays wet continuously, they're yeah, going to love it. Stays wet. Yeah, because yeah, the cup, co- the cover is a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a dense, uh, foam, you know, thin. You know, eighth of an inch foam pad, but it's white. Uh, a, yeah, uh, I would just, I, hot it's tub probably cover. hard for them to grip onto the plastic. Okay. Um, you know, so if you, if you could put a layer of something else over the plastic, I think that'll appeal to them more. Okay, I'll give it a shot. Thanks. Yeah, uh, question from Kevin. Well, I'll, another comment, actually. Um, my watering system, I wish I could post a picture up here, but uh, because a picture is worth a thousand words. What I've got is a uh, planter uh, that's got, that's waterproof. And over that, I have put a screen so bees cannot get into the water. But over that, I've got uh, one of those planter uh, drain pans full of rocks that I've uh, set across the top. And what I've got is a uh, pond pump that pumps water from the container below into the pan of rocks and it's solar powered. So the water is always in the pan full of rocks uh, when the sun's out. And of course the bees are there and they don't have any problems. So. Um, the main thing I have to do is every few days just fill up that bottom reservoir. And um, that's what I've been using for several years now. So uh, maybe I can get a picture on the um, um, the club's site. Uh, and that's that's all I got to say about water. The bees really like it. I- uh, Kit, did you hear that? Kevin just volunteered to write an article for the blog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it'd be short and sweet. Just, uh, yeah, I can do that if, if, uh, if you want. Other questions? Don't see anything. quiet group tonight so i don't know should the, is it a wrap are we done sounds like a wrap yeah it does okay well Ed, thank you everyone do you have any final words kit is your mic still on actually i'm not even sure kit's still here um, well, I want to thank Eli again for her time and interest in helping out our club. I, I thought the presentation was fantastic. So uh, we really appreciated you you doing this for us. 
You're welcome. I'm glad you're interested in listening because, you know, everybody loves to talk bees, right? Have you seen that t-shirt that says, beekeeper, warning, may start to talk bees? <laughs> it's something like that. <laughs> what do you mean? I have one of those. <laughs> you really? Seriously? <laughs> I thought that was so neat. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, have a great night. Um, and when the recording's ready, I'll post a, um, a copy of this to the YouTube channel. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Good night, thank everybody. You. Thank you, Jeff. Bye. Thank you, Eli. Thank you. Bye.